First, I just want to thank our speakers for those two fabulous papers. Um, and the floor is open. Okay, first Arjun, and then Odette, and then Peter. Well, again, two uh, amazing, uh, amazing papers with connections to all the other papers, certainly to my own uh, evolving thought on these difficult themes. So thank you each and both. Uh, many things I'm sure will come up in the next half hour, but I'll just uh, try and be as concise as possible uh, with one question or comment to each of you. Uh, uh, to uh, Let's see, to Bonnie's paper, which has a lot of things I haven't thought about, and certainly have not thought about in that way, one thing that occurred to me, which is a very specific thing, is uh, apart from my discussion yesterday about action and newness of the world and Arendt, my, my own out-of-body experiences with Arendt in 1971 or two, uh, the thing I was thinking uh, on the inoperativity issue and putting things out of use, so to speak, and Agamemnon's review of that and saying, well, it's not out of use, it's some. What I was thinking is for all the three forms, the Saturday form, the seven-year form, and the 49-year form, would it be fruitful, whether in terms of Agamemnon or in any other terms, to see that reframing that happens, that interruption that happens in the idiom of sacrifice, that is giving up in a larger cause. And if one inserted that, would one change the logic? Would one add to it? I don't know. In other words, the thing that's done to work, the thing that's done to conversation, the thing that's done to land, the thing is not only some reframing or suspension or interruption, but actually an offering to something collective, communal. And that may be another road to get to equality. So that's one thought. Uh, Eric's paper is so full of uh, wonderful uh, things, connections to not just my work, but to a whole tradition of work on manner and fetish. And I'm thinking of the not very far away totem. Uh, again, Freud to Levi Strauss and all that. And I'm thinking somewhere in all this that could fruitfully come in. But I'll put my uh, question very specific so that I can understand eventually, when I read the paper not better, the whole very complex argument is what is the actual uh, link or uh, difference between the surplus of signification and the surplus of scarcity? So both terms you use, each of them when you use them, I think I get it, uh, but then uh, are they two sides of one coin? Is one the meta of the other? And to me, distinguishing them and saying exactly what they are in relation to each other would make everything else easier to grasp in your overall line of argument, both about the unconscious, about language itself, uh, and, and the question of, of, of surplus. Because the surplus signification leads me one way, the surplus of scarcity leads me slightly somewhere else. So anyway, that's a, that's a, a readerly question, you might say, as opposed to a conceptual question. But many thanks to each of you. Yeah, I mean, I you know, um, are they two sides of the same coin? Yes. Um, I mean, I, um, I, I, I guess the, the other, uh, we have, let's say, these divinatory sciences because we live with a surplus of signification that can't be um, converted into positive knowledge, but is a kind of a movement of within, you know, say, the space of symbolic practices and, and activities um, that we that that, um, that that in a certain sense fundamentally organize our, our orientation in the world um, you know a form of, that, a, a fundamental to you know any form of life and I want to say that I'm I'm calling it surplus scarcity um, because to, re, to bring it closer to the you know to the economic, to, you know, to, to, so, but it does have, but it's, I mean, uh, um, Levi Strauss calls it as just simply a, a, you know, a gap in, 
you know, in, in, in knowledge, the capacity to know how we become knowers. I mean, it's in a way, it's the problem of every social contract theory, you know, any art and story, you have to presuppose, you know, something there in order to tell the story of how it comes about. So it's sort of the haunting by this, you know, of this gap. But I want to say that, that um, let me put this way, under, one way to understand capitalism is that um, this scarcity um, becomes converted into, um, it gets caught up in a narrative of debt and payability of debt. In other words, that's, the scarcity can be made good. Yes. Um, and maybe another way of putting, you know, something that I would say, you know, about Bonnie is that Sabbath is in a certain sense rehearsing the rem reminding us that it's not for you to make this good, you know, that you, that in a way to stop doing that, you know, stop trying. Like, you know, and, you know, and which means to be silent, and that's, you know, and to engage, you know, that's another thing that Rosenzweig said, to engage in exegesis, you know, just reading, you know, of the, of the biblical text, you know, week to week, a passage. So there's something about, there's a kind of the disciplining, the quieting down, I want to say it's not quieting down from useful work. It's quieting down this maniacal, enjoy, you know, this, the work that's overtime, that's in surplus of producing what we actually really need in life. But we don't know what we need because it's always, you know, invested with this, you know, this demand for, demand for work, what Freud calls the drive, which pertains to something that can't be, that can't be repaired. Um, but, and, but we only have the language of repair, you know, so the question is what do we do with it? And I think that's, in a certain sense, you know, literature, poetry, the arts, and so on, are one of the, the sites in which we, let's say, elaborate purposely, you know, um, pur purposely, yeah. So, um, is this working? Yeah. Um, I want to say uh, we want to. We don't want to make good, but we do want to be better. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly. um, and uh, I, I had a, a similar uh, response, Arjun, to your question in a way, which is um, that there's uh, the. I'm just thinking with you. I don't know if in the end I think this, but right in the moment, I feel like the idiom of sacrifice is a uh, part of an economy, um, and that the idea of giving an offering reinstalls to some extent the sovereignty that Sabbath seeks to suspend. Um, so positioning us not in a rehearsal of equality per se, but of the making good. Um, that wasn't the word I had in mind, but um, once Eric said it, I think that works very well for my response as well. Um, I do think, um, however, that the cessation of work, uh, to which Eric referred towards the end of his paper in anticipation of the paper I didn't quite give, just teasing you, um, is, uh, is a rehearsal of a different work. And so, you know, you came closer to that now when you were talking about elaboration. Um, but in your earlier formulations, I thought we might differ on that. Um, so now I think maybe we don't. Um, but I do think um, the idea of Sabbath as the day of rest is enabled uh, to operate as a kind of inoperativity cessation of work until you link it to land sabbatical and debt sabbatical and slave emancipation. Which have, uh, which have a different kind of call. Um, and I guess I, I thought after I sat down, I should have said um, that, uh, that in a nutshell, what the argument was, and this is still by way of response to you, is that Graeber cannot have Jubilee without Sabbath, and that Heschel cannot have Sabbath without Jubilee, um, which I could sum up with a slogan, there's no rest without equality. And equality is a labor, so it, the humanities may inform and inspire it in the ways that you've described, um, but uh, would not be, be fully adequate to the demand. Yeah. Can I just say one more thing? Another thing that I think may be helpful is I, I think that where is mana now? Like where are we maniacal now? And I think the main site is in the no with the notion of brand. 
I think branding is, brand is the locus of mana. And I think that the, the fact that, that we have a president who is a brand, who is a brand name, is, it, it tells us a lot about where, where mana, where, what are the sites of mana for us now? Um, and so in a certain sense we have brand loyalty as opposed to patriotism, you know, something like that. Okay, we have a lot of questions, so I'm gonna say two at a time. Uh, so Odette and Peter, and then the speakers can respond, then we'll take others. Thanks so much. Um, so yeah, these are just amazing talks. Um, my question is, is more for Bonnie. Um, so I love this idea of a sabbatical of equality and thinking about equalization in this way. Um, had not thought of that, that, that was uh, great. My question is, if you think about a sab sabbatical of equality and equalization, I wonder what that tells us about the non-sabbatical days and years. And I wonder if there is a, a concern about having equalization be this sort of exceptional thing that happens every seven days or every 50 years, which is really a long time, as in some ways, <laughs> right, I mean, especially back when that was written, I mean, what is a life cycle, yeah. right? Um, you know, is as sort of normalizing or allowing the inequality that exists in those other days, and also the, it sort of hardens the edges of the operationalization of those other days, right? And so you could think of that as a sort of, as a conceptual question, but you can also think of it on the level of a very practical, like if we were to live in such a world, as you approach to the year of the Jubilee, you can imagine <laughs> the terms of debt contracts becoming entirely more um, punishing right? In anticipation of the fact that there is a jubilee. The fact that there is not an expectation of debt forgiveness means that we can in some ways soften and lengthen the edges of the, the contracts by which people are trapped. And so I don't think that's necessarily going to be the outcome, though I think if we brought some bankers in, they would be like, that's absolutely, that, that's going to be the outcome. <laughs> uh, and, you know, maybe that would be the case, but I wonder how you think of that, um, of those things as coming together. No, Peter. Thank you for your two papers. Uh, so many, many ideas and thoughts that uh, will keep us busy, I guess. Um, <laughs> so, you, I was struck by many things, but among other things, I would like to to, to say something about uh, two thoughts that you both uh, shared, not the same one, about narrative. So, Bonnie, you, you insisted on, on counting, and I couldn't help thinking that counting and recounting uh, was uh, in the background of uh, what you said about temporality. And uh, Eric, you, you shared this really intriguing, uh, I mean, thought-provoking hypothesis that in, um, in all uh, narratives of death, <clears throat> you said there is an anthropogenic narrative that is embedded. Um, and I'm also thinking that in the end, both of you, Bonnie, with this formula that you borrowed from, from Agamben, man is a sabbatical animal. And um, Eric, when you talked about Nietzsche and, and Agamben too, um, in the end, what was at stake was precisely the genesis of, of man. Now, I'm thinking uh, Agamben is full of... of uh, anthropocentric metaphysical definitions uh, of, of man. Uh, one of them I'm thinking of is man uh, is the only animal that goes to the movies, for example. <laughs> uh, so man is the sabbatical animal. So, and, and they all echo in a way, you know, man is the animal that has the logos, man is the political animal. So they all echo these metaphysical definitions. Now, what I'm thinking, my, my, my thought or question is, uh, can, actually it echoes a discussion we had in, in class, and, uh, that's also a hello to my students who are here. Um, is it possible to think of debt um, in, uh, with, towards animals, among animals? Uh, and I think this is a huge question. Uh, so has uh, any discourse about debt, uh, does it have to be anthropogenic and maybe one step further, anthropocentric. 
that, that would be, I think, a, a huge question. I mean, I don't know that um, anything I said about anthropogenesis um, would preclude in any way a sense of, of obligations, you know, of um, responsibilities toward animals. I just wouldn't call them debts. Uh, um, so I think that's, um, again, I mean, we've talked about that this has been a sort of recurring question or occurring issue in, um, in the conference. That it's very hard to um, talk about what we owe one another um, without thinking of that as, as a kind of debt, a payable debt. Um, but certainly we want to say there's basically what normativity means is that um, I owe you reasons for doing or saying what, for making the claims that I, I make and, and I ascribe to you the capacity also to give reasons for what you claim and sort of we owe that to one another, you know, and there are, there, there are um, protocols of reason giving, you know, the, the game of giving and, and, um, and, and asking for reasons, but that's a kind of, you know, I don't I wouldn't call that a debt. And I say the same thing with respect to, you know, there are all kinds of ways of thinking of our responsibilities toward living things or to the earth and, you know, whatever. But I, again, the, the problem, I, I almost think that those things, we're not able really to think straight, you know, about those things because we, I think, conf or it's very hard not to conflate, you know, what we owe, you know, accounting for ourselves and being responsible to this, you know, um, Nietzschean, you know, how do you breed an animal capable of making promises, which is basically um, becoming a debtor, you know, um, being in a relation of creditor and debtor. And so I, it's, I'm not sure if, um, I, I think I was, tr I, was tr I guess I was trying to say that by, um, that the way Levi Strauss tells this anthrop you know, anthropogenic story, um, one could say that this, um, you know, this gap does not have to be thought of as a, you know, um, something that could be payable, you know, something that anyone could be could make good, and therefore, you know, has to be indemnified, you know. So, it, so the question of how to separate out responsibility, what we owe to one another, from the language of debt and stories of, of indebtedness, it's very, very hard to do. I, um, so this is maybe a point of strong agreement and disagreement um, because I don't think that promising, uh, that's the point I was trying to make with Arendt, that pr you can have a conception of promising in which to promise does not mean to become a debtor. This is the perversion that Graeber names and I think Arendt is offering a kind of avant la lettre, transvaluation of values of the kind that Graeber says he's in search of. Um, because the promising there is not um, dyadic, it's world building and inaugural and communal, so it has a different quality than the bargains that we make when we promise in a different vein. Um, that said, I do completely agree that there are a bunch of very uh, subtly different concepts that work in these questions and uh, we need to uh, pay attention to that. Um, that I also think, I mean, I have a lot to say about debt to animals, but I do think that there are modes of uh, blessing in Judaism and in indigenous practices as well, where, you know, you don't eat without thanking, which is an acknowledgement of the debt. Um, in Judaism, it tends to be you thank God for providing, and in some indigenous cultures, you actually thank the animal for, for providing. Um, but I think there are ways in which the debt is not expiated but acknowledged and you live that relationship to animality through debt. Um, I think man is the only animal that goes to the movies is the same thing as saying that man is a sabbatical animal because what Agamben means in both of those is that we're the creatures that pass our time uselessly um, in, in a way that this is what, you know, what distinguishes us. I'm not sure that it is what distinguishes us, but I think there's, there's a, a kind of per, perpetual elaboration of this idea in Agamben. Um, and uh, so, th so that's a kind of set of responses to your questions, Peter. And then to Odette, I, um, I want to say uh, that this problem that you point to at the beginning is the problem that I was myself calling attention to, the, how this 
these practices can be seen to extend the life of inequality or redress the life of inequality. And it's, you know, you can't, it's not either one structurally, like in practice it could be one or the other, but structurally there's nothing about the sabbatical stuff that necessarily decides that you're not extending the life of inequality by having these exceptional moments. So I completely agree with that. I think that's the supplementary structure. Um, your question about what if we brought some bankers in, you know, I can tell you some of you will know who. I brought an economist in and I asked him, uh, who, uh, what would an economy that worked like this look like? I then said, don't you think this would be an interesting project to work on together? <laughs> and um, I was told by a, this economist that, you know, it wasn't possible to have an economy that looked like this for the reasons that you just said, which is everyone would see the jubilee coming and would start to alter their behavior in a self-interested way. I then said, but what if we didn't assume that people were self-interested in that way? And, you know, then we moved on to other topics. So, <laughs> <laughs> and then the last thing I'll say, just because I've come back to it now that I'm thinking with uh, Peter, that your point about counting and recounting, so of course I assume you mean like in English to recount is to tell a story, and I think that's lovely and I accept this gift and I think that would be worth thinking with. I hadn't thought of it, so thank you. Okay, uh, next two questioners are Suzanne and Adi, and then we have one more question uh, from Joseph, so we'll, uh, but we'll take these two and then answer and then we'll take those. Okay, questions. so, Tim yeah. In, and then Tim, okay. Tim Thank you go. both for uh, great papers. Um, and so I wanted to uh, invite you maybe to speak to each other um, on, on, on a particular, because one thing that was striking to me is that you both papers had these moments of what I would call almost a conversion narrative. Um, Bonnie, you saying that the ideas that you laid out very elegantly about the Sabbath have to have a kind of conversion to the question of equality, right? I mean, oh, if you will, a supplement. But, but it, these, you know, this structure without that move into equality would not work. And Eric, um, the, you know, you end with saying that there might be a need to supplement, um, well, that you uh, say that the drive or fantasy of, uh, of transforming scarcity into a debt might, what, what behind debt might be that fantasy, which is another form of a conversion. Now, I'm wondering whether the two, the, these two kinds of conversions could work one on the other. In other words, what room would you give, Eric, in that transformation to equality? <laughs> and, and Bonnie, would, do, would you have space for the idea of that kind of phantasmatic, mm -hmm. supplemental, unconvertible, if you will, um, structure? Well, if he accepts equality, I'll accept signification. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> <laughs> the art of the deal. That's right there. Right. Can, can I say, um, can I just, I, I just, oh, are we again? supposed we to take the next question? Oh, yeah, wait for Adi. I forgot. Unless forgot. you just want that to be the answer, no. which would no. also be fine. No. 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 <laughs> uh, thank you. This was really wonderful. Uh, I have a, a slightly long question, so uh, just one for Bonnie. Um, you left out from your beautiful reconstruction of the three moments of sab Sabbath in, in Judaism, you left out three things, which I think... <laughs> only three. Only three. <laughs> exactly. Which I think... <laughs> uh, I, I would like to, to make it very clear. I, uh, it's not that I want to protect them. Uh, it's not that I want to insist that they should be in. But I, I would like to mention them and to think, what, what does it mean to leave them out? One is the basic thing that... Uh, uh, the, the, the distinction between a Hebrew and a non-Hebrew is built into the sabbatical practice. Mm -hmm. So uh, a Hebrew slave is different than a Canaanite slave, etc. Uh, the other uh, regarding equality uh, is the fact that uh, the Jubilee does not restitute, restitute equality. They say uh, each one go back to his possession. Mm -hmm. This is King's term. Uh, translation, which is precise, each one goes back to his possession and to his family. Mm -hmm. Well, families are not equal, mm -hmm. and nor are possessions. So it's, it's like going back, uh, slowing the movement of inequality, 
but not restituting, restituting quality, uh, according to, to, I think, the, 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 the letter of the, mm -hmm. of the text. And, and about counting, this was a problem from the very beginning. You know, Jubilee, I think, was never practiced. Uh, Shemitah, the seventh year, and Shabbat, of course, they were always practiced. Uh, Shemitah less, and Shabbat, always. Uh, the, the question of counting was, was a real question, and, and it, it was institutionalized. Mm -hmm. There was, uh, very soon, a policing of the counting. Mm -hmm. So there are, f the, the 49 days between Passover and, and Shabbat are exactly what is described. They, everyone counts together. Mm -hmm. But this is just seven weeks of the year. Uh, but the years are counted by the rabbinic tribunal. Uh, when, from the moment there was a, a, a rabbinic institution, there were rabbinic institutions. So there are three things here: equality, uh, which is it, it's never equality, but something less than equality. Uh, the need to police and the distinction between uh, a member and a non-member of the of the tribe. Mm -hmm. uh, so m my question is not to keep them, these things, but can we really think about the sabbatical uh, this, uh, concept, as a concept, as, as a uh, kind of emancipatory concept? Can we think about it without giving answers to these three uh, uh, moments that, that you left? Okay, okay. so um, maybe I'll just respond initially to the first part of Suzanne's question because it reminded me also of Odette's question which I left unanswered the one part which is this 50th year like what good is that people are barely living to 50 anyway um, so I just I, I, I just want to say that um, this interrupts what Tony Bokes was talking about yesterday which is how uh, parents and children and grandchildren remain in slavery without interruptions like this. So you may not live to see your own emancipation, but Jubilee means that your children will be emancipated when the time comes. This is not nothing, it's not everything, but it's not nothing. Um, so that's, you know, something. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure, then I'll continue actually with your, your question, Suzanne. Um, I'm not sure that there's a conversion built into the structure of Sabbath the way I understand it, but I'm happy to listen to Eric's response and then reconsider. Um, I just think what I was trying to do, and this transitions me to Adi's question, is to um, uh, sort of bring to the to foreground an equality demand that I think is exigent in the Sabbath structure in all three and that you can find, you know, most people think about the Sabbath as the day of rest, but if you read Heschel and Rosenzweig, you see that they're working with it as a kind of rehearsal of equality too, even the weekly Sabbath, and it just helps to get there if you put it in the context of this tripartite structure. So I don't know if it's a conversion as much as a, a more imminent kind of operation, maybe. I, that's what I'm thinking in the moment. Um, Adi? I thought you were going to ask me about something else when you said three. Um, I thought at least one of them would be about the Kol Nidre service, which is where you, uh, we all just release ourselves and each other from our debts, promises made during the course of the year, which I actually have a discussion of in the longer paper as itself also a sabbatical practice. Um, so, but you didn't ask me about that. So, um, I... Um, what I see that's interesting about the sabbatical structure, and I, I don't deny that there's a distinction between the Hebrew and the non-Hebrew. I don't deny that when the slave is emancipated, the enslaved person is emancipated, they're sent back to their possessions and their family as they were, although I did share with you those requirements of manumission, which is that you don't just send a person out of your house after they've been in service to you, but you, you give them some things, um, which is more than, you know, it's. It could have been 40 acres and a mule. I mean, it's that kind of a thing. So, uh, so more than uh, the emancipated got here. Um, so I don't want to deny any of those things. What I want to say is that here's, and again, this goes back to Odette's question as well. Here's an example of not just of the clean slate legislations that Graeber wants to point to, which I've also pointed to you know, from the ancient world, but an example of an economy that is built structurally around the recognition that even in a relatively just economy for its own members, um, that inequality will accrete over time 
and that the economy has to have, this is like the autoimmunity of the economy, it has to have some way of responding to that. And so it, I'm not at all saying like this is the best response you could ever come up with, but more that structurally it's interesting to identify economic formations in which there was a kind of forethought to, uh, to uh, addressing its uh, injustices and injuries uh, where possibly no particular transaction would have been unjust and nonetheless there would have been a kind of accreted injustice over time. Just in principle, I'm not saying there wouldn't have been injustices. So, um, so that's what I'm finding here, uh, sort of floating as an exemplary possibility but not as the example obviously for us to follow. Um, but the reason why I also think it's important and interesting is that there are reclamations of Sabbath right now in the sense of rest. We need the day of rest and they don't come with this exigency of equality that I think is in here even if it's flawed because it is restricted to the community of Sabbatarians, right, of, of Israelites or, not, or Hebrews. Um, so yeah, that's, I, think, I, I think that's all I have to say for the moment. Do you want to? No, uh, no. Uh the only thing, I, I, this is not really an answer, but um, I, I, I think what I was tr trying to say is um, a um, undoing a conversion, like suspending it. This is what inoperative, rendering that conversion inoperative, the conversion of surplus scarcity into payable debt, into a narrative of payable debt. And what I find actually is, it, and I think it's interesting because it just Rosenzweig, um, in a way, became Rosenzweig. Um, when he decided not to convert mm -hmm. to Christianity. In a certain sense, he made some, he, I mean, he claimed, you know, it's myth, mythologized a bit, but he, he had some relevant uh, revelation that he, he didn't have to, that what he, what he wanted to do, what he was interested in doing, was something that didn't, that in a way was, he would have missed by converting. Um, so there's some, there's something about, um, this, his, his decision not to convert that I think is actually not just external to the, your question. It's somehow connected. I can't make the connection here. Which mythically took place at Colnica's service. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, so um, we're kind of running over significantly. Uh, we have a firm 2.30 start. I want to make sure there's time for lunch. So here's what I'm going to suggest, that Joseph and Tim concisely ask their questions, and then Bonnie and Eric extremely concisely. But yes or no. Yes or no, nod sagely, say, gee, I'll think about that. Um, okay, so, Joseph, and then Tim. Okay, he's gonna forego his question, yeah? Oh, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true test of character. <laughs> Are you going to? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. There's, uh, Bonnie, there's something else that you missed out or left out of your paper. I also don't necessarily want to put it back in, but I'm interested in where it went. In, in fact, in both of your papers, and that is art. Um, Kant's critique of judgment is obviously crucial to both of your papers. The misreading that Agamben of, you know, that Agamben talks about. Uh, the misreading of purposelessness is, of course, resolved in Kant's notion of purposeless purposiveness. So I'm just wondering how, in both of your papers, it seemed to me, following on from Suzanne, that mana and uh, the sabbatical are analogous, they're, they're, they're analogous concepts, or at least they, they seem in, in, con in conversation. Um, how do we ensure that we don't lose the political... Um, power of these concepts by um, in merely aesthetics, I guess, is, what, is my crude, rather irritating question. Yes? My, my, my <laughs> question is that I, I don't, I think that I would reject the merely, you know, and that's obviously requires a big discussion, but sure. I, I think that's a reflex and, and I, I, it's not that I would, I, I don't think one has to even go in the direction that Bonnie is going to, to counter the critiques of Arendt as aestheticizing. I think just say, okay, well, you know, let's just think harder what is happening there. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, so I want to say even though I was countering the critiques of her as aestheticizing, I wouldn't have affiliated myself with the you know, rejection of the aesthetic, but merely to suggest that it was a really misapprehension of her project to accuse her of that. Um, so that's one thing, and the other thing is I wouldn't, I would not accept the word insure. So, <laughs> so in other words, there's no way to ensure that you don't err in that direction. That's kind of the whole reason that Arendt offers us the centrality of forgiveness, because when we do this work, we end up in places we don't anticipate. So that's just an abbreviated response. Okay. We let's, can talk more at lunch. Let's thank our speakers.